Thank you for joining us today. Um, our NGO is called the Federation of Zoroastrian Associations of North America. And Zoroastrianism is a faith, and we are a faith-based NGO. And I realize that not everyone knows about who the Zoroastrians are. So we have this flyer that we've uh, made up about who the Zoroastrians are and about our faith. So if you want to know more information about it, it is in the back on the table. Um, so maybe on your way out, if you're interested, you can pick up one of these flyers. Um, but today our uh, panel of speakers are going to talk to you about educating girls and how it's an empowering tool to promote prosperity and gender equality. Um, we'll also be covering the empowerment of adolescent girls in rural India, the effect of the environmental degradation on indigenous tribes in Central Africa, the effects of landmines on the children in Nepal, and the interventions of several NGOs on education of the girl child in the slums of Mumbai. India has the largest number of girl brides in the world, one third of the global total. And child marriages deny girls an education and their childhood. So not only is a child affected by the marriage, but that also affects the surrounding community in an economical and social way. So one of our Zoroastrian ladies, the one that's in the middle, Armin Modi, she is from Japan and she started an NGO that she was passionate about um, because she wanted to educate the girl child. And she heard that girls were getting married as young as age 12. So she started an NGO called Ashta no Kai, which, is, um, which means for a better tomorrow in Japanese. Um, she started in a rural village called Shirur, which is um, close to the big city of Pune in India. And um, her NGO did a lot of groundwork to change the cultural thinking of the parents um, in Shirur to allow their daughters to go to school and get an education instead of getting married at a young age. The parents would send their sons to school. They would give them bicycles because the schools were usually anywhere from five to 10 kilometers away. So the boys would ride their bikes to school, but the girls were not allowed to go to school. Um, so Armin decided that she would work on changing the thinking of the families um, in that village so that they would allow their daughters to go to school. And to do that, she got bikes donated to her NGO and some were purchased by her NGO and then given either at low rent or um, donated to the girls in the village so that they would travel in large groups to go to school uh, because the parents were concerned about girls and their safety going so far away to a school. What I'm gonna do now is um, show you a quick video of Ashtano Kai. Can you all hear? My name is Katana Kutaka. Uh, I am uh, 14 years old and I live in Sunshine. I am going to Ningo Fugai School. I am learning in the ninth standard. For about a couple of years, we only focused on adult women and literacy for them. 
And I noticed many of the uh, girls who came to the class were very, very young girls with a uh, Mangal Sutra, which is a gold and black beaded necklace around their necks, which in India is a symbol of matrimony. And uh, they had babies on their hips, and I started to ask what's going on and why are such young girls married off already. In many villages, there were only uh, schools till seventh grade. There were no high schools. So we worked in 10 villages at that point in time, and there were only three high schools. So uh, then I asked, uh, you know, I asked the parents, the mothers, well, what happens to the boys? You know, how do you send the boys to school? And they said, uh, well, we give them bicycles. And I said, well, what about the girl? They said, oh, no, it's a waste of money to give a bicycle to a girl. She's going to turn around and get married. And uh, there's a famous Indian saying, uh, why water a plant that's going to grow in a neighbor's garden? So I thought, my God, if it's only a bicycle that's keeping girls from going to school, let's go ahead and uh, you know, give it to them. So since starting this uh, Bicycle Bank program with Ashanokai, um, the villages have found that um, there has been vast improvement with the girls' education. And Armin has been able to grow that NGO even further. And they've introduced a life skills education program. They've introduced a scholarship program for girls who wanted to do college and university for their studies. They also started a karate program for the girls and the women in the villages for self-defense. And they started a community mobilization program where the mothers from the villages would get together and initiate and start collaborative projects. So as you can see, um, the program's grown quite a bit. When they first started, a girl child um, got married at the mean age of 12. 
But after this program, um, the girl child would get married at the mean age of 19. So it was quite an achievement. And uh, married girls who completed their desired level of education before this program was 16%, and then after the program was 45%. Girls who completed up to grade 12 before the program was 58%, and then after the program was 80%. So as you can see, the program has been very successful in the villages in Shurur. Um, this is just one example of an NGO. The speakers on our panel, um, they're all gonna talk about the NGOs that they have worked with and the advancement in educating the girl child. So I'm going to start with um, our first speaker, Tanya Parda. She is from Mississauga, Ontario, Canada, and she's completed her undergraduate degree in Women and Gender Studies, Italian and Political Science from the University of Toronto. She is a flight attendant for Air Canada and also works at a women's shelter as a women's advocate. She's worked with different NGOs in India to make a difference in the world through education of underprivileged children because she believes that every child needs equality, not charity. Thank you. Nelson Mandela once said, education is the most powerful weapon which you can use to change the world. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Today, I will be talking to you about educating girls in Mumbai, India. Without proper education, it is extremely difficult for girls to leave the poverty that has been haunting them and to move forward. I will be taking you all through a journey of four different non-government organizations or NGOs and the issues they face with some solutions. The first organization I would like to talk about is Prem Dan Garden School. This is a school that was run by nuns for underprivileged children. The school works with children from the ages of three to six years old from nearby slums. And once the children are six years old, they are sent to a convent where they will continue their education. During the ages of three to six, they usually learn ABCs, one, two, threes, and communication in English. A major problem I encountered with the school was the transportation from the home to the school because kids would have to walk kilometers and kilometers and miles to get there. Therefore, this organization created a solution where they brought the school into the slums. So it was very convenient for the children to walk five minutes to go to school and therefore there was no excuse. Even the girls who did not come to school, the teachers would go to their house, pick them up and bring them to school. Therefore, there's no excuse for a girl not to get the proper education that she deserves. The next organization is Salam Bala Trust, which is an organization that helps street children get an education and have a future. It is a way for the children not to be on the streets and to be accountable for going to school and having someone always there for anything that they need. So a lot of the girls, they need incentives because to them they have nothing to lose. The teachers at this organization wanted to treat all of the girls who did well in their school year and who went to school regularly. Therefore, all the girls who received 60% or her higher in that school year received a, a chance to go for a Bollywood movie and have snacks and some food. This was a way for those, girl, for those girls who did receive the 60% to work better and the year after it would became 65 and then 70 and to continue them to continue for them to have a good um, to get good grades in school it was also an incentive for those who did not receive that mark to work harder so that they can receive these kind of privileges while parents should be encouraging girls to go to school and get an education they are sometimes they are a barrier and discourage them from going it's because these parents do not know what the value of an, edu what an educated girl is. However, there have been cases where the father becomes so drunk and he stops the girls from going to school and, and forces them to stay at home. And this is where this NGO steps in. Information and having parents involved is extremely important. 
going to their house, discuss discussing the issues and the benefits of going to school. There was a girl named Pinky who wouldn't go to school because her mother forced her to stay at home and said, you don't have to go to school. Your brother's gonna go to school, but you're going to stay at home and work and clean the house. Seeing this pattern, an intern and I decided to actually go to her house to talk to her mother and explain to her the value of her daughter going to school. Her mother finally agreed to send her. But Pinky said, I don't want to go anymore because, I, because I've not gone for so long, I don't want to be left behind. So we, I decided that every day I would go to her house, I would pick her up, I would take her to school, I would stay at school the entire day until she finished, and I would bring her home. After doing that, for one week, she went on her own, and even to date, I did go to India recently, and she is thriving. Mm. So that extra step is that extra step is very important because it gives these girls hope that somebody believes in them. The next organization is Vinny My Trust, which is an organization that focuses on helping underprivileged girls and rehabilitating underprivileged youth. These girls come from all different institutions around Mumbai due to different reasons like child prostitution, being an orphan, or child marriage. Before they entered the institution, they had no education, but these institutions helped them gain the knowledge that they needed more than one way. There was a camp which was meant for all these girls from all these different institutions where they could come together and meet other girls. Most of these girls were isolated into the four walls of that institution and never left. So this was a great way for them to experience new things and see what life is like when they leave after they turn 18. Having these girls listen to other experiences and learn and relate to them was very important for them to move forward and create change. So these girls at this camp also needed proper knowledge on what to expect when they go out into the real world and how to make a difference. Therefore, the camp had different workshops which, taught, which were taught by other girls who had gone through the same experiences they have. And also how they got to experience life outside the institution, which gave them insight on what they should expect. There was also a session on the world and on different cultures that exist worldwide, as well as a session on finance because they needed to open an account, they needed to save money, they needed to know the entire process. One really interesting activity was a mock election where the girls were divided and had to campaign for a party where they would vote and then see who wins. This was a great way for them to see what they, what they can also do to change the world through governments, through politics, how they can make that little impact into the world. So this camp was a great way for the girls to have the tools they needed to take the world by storm and to prove that this circle, the cycle of poverty can end. The last organization is called Sujaya Foundation, which works towards bridging the gap between education and employment. The multiple programs of this organization benefit children and youth, especially, especially girls and women, towards a better future. So if a teacher cannot speak the language, how are they expected to teach other children that same language? Most of the teachers at this municipal school level do not have the proper knowledge of the English language. We created a program for these teachers to converse in English and use these activities in their daily lives. These teachers had the theoretical knowledge but not the conversational knowledge and that is where we stepped in. There was also a one month intensive program that built English conversational skills and confidence of college students and youth. This program was for young students who wanted to go into employment, which required them to speak in English, and also for those who wanted the knowledge, which is essential, essential for them to learn English. Most of the parents of these girls speak in their regional or national language, and they don't have that practice at home. Therefore, this program was a great opportunity for them to speak in English and try and converse in, another, in, in, a, in English, which, was, which is a very important language worldwide. These conversations allow young girls to obtain the confidence in speaking in another language to empower them to achieve everything possible. 
There was also a four-day interview session for, for youth, mainly girls, who are planning on applying to have uh, applying to a job or already have a job. The different presentation, there were different presentations on grooming, resume writing, and interview skills, as well as mock interviews at the end of the session. This was extra beneficial for the girls as it, as it is harder for them to get a job. They gain confidence and that can be shown during the interview. There is no excuse as to why girls should not get an education. While there are multiple barriers, there are also multiple solutions to overcome them. Every girl deserves an education and nothing should stop them. Thank you. Thank you, Tanya. I'm just going to set up for the next speaker. Okay, our next speaker is going to be Anahita Rami. She has a BS from Cornell University where she studied biology and anthropology. She is currently working as a research assistant for the Elephant Listening Project, a conservation NGO at Cornell. Last year, she spent a wild four months living and working in the Central African rainforest while conducting research on the forest elephants of Dzenga Bay in the southern part of Central African Republic. So please welcome Anna. Thank you, Tanya. Hi everyone. Um, so today I will be speaking um, about the potential impacts of, uh, of empowering women through conservation initiatives and environmental education programs in Bayanga, which is a small village located in the Central African Republic. So what are some impacts of environmental degradation? So as a lot of people know, biodiversity is closely connected to a lot of things, and this includes development, access to resources, income generation, food, and essential household products. But as this global decline in biodiversity continues, that means that the poorest people are the groups that are going to be the most affected. And most often, the poorest people are women and children. So women and men are impacted differently by environmental degradation. Women play key roles in managing natural resources for their families and their communities, but their access to these natural resources differs than that of men due to the gender division of labor. So to achieve sustainable development, we must utilize a gender perspective. So what are the specific impacts on women? So as environmental degradation continues, it's more common to see natural resource management uh, programs implemented, so the establishments of parks. And, but while this is really beneficial for biodiversity, that severely undermines women's access to the land. Um, so there's changing land use patterns. So more time as a result needs to be spent by women to gather basic subsistence, such as food, water, and fuel. So what I wanna do is uh, look at the Bayaka, um, who is a group I worked with a little bit while I was in CAR. Um, they are suffering greatly from environmental degradation. And they're a semi-nomadic group of hunter-gatherers found um, in Central African Republic, Southeastern Cameroon, Northern Republic of Congo, and uh, Northern Gabon. So within, um, within the Bayaka society, women are largely responsible for gathering fruit and fish, cultivating plants, and practicing beekeeping. But due to their semi-nomadic lifestyle in combination with their short stature, uh, the Bayaka are often discriminated against and marginalized from society. So historically, they have been referred to as pygmies, which is a term that is no longer considered respectful today. Um, and as an ethnic minority, they're facing discrimination. Um, they're being excluded from school systems and often forced to forego their culture to assimilate into encroaching Bantu society. So what are the specific impacts of deforestation on the Bayaka? Well, so they rely completely on the forest for absolute subsistence and for a source of income. 40% of the instruments that they use for cooking, hunting, gathering, and rituals are made partially or entirely out of resources found in the forest. In addition, um, since they're not able to access the same levels of food as they were previously, uh, there's an ongoing food insecurity issue that's impacting Bayaka women uh, specifically. They're the ones you know, taking care of the children and their grandchildren, but not receiving the appropriate nutrition um, at the same time. 
Um, so they are, you know, having the highest levels of chronic malnutrition, lowest hemoglobin levels among the community. Is this better? Yeah. Okay. Louder. Okay. So um, where I was working um, is a small village in the central, uh, southwestern part of the Central African Republic. It's a village called Bayanga. This is better, right? Yeah. Okay. Um, so the Bayanga is a Sangha Sangha fishing village located right along the Sangha River, which is uh, running through CAR, goes down into Northern Republic of Congo. Um, it's made up of approximately 4,000 residents, most of which are fishing and uh, you know subsisting off the forest in the region. And um, I was working there as a researcher with the Elephant Listing Project um, and interacted a lot with the Bayaka through day-to-day -day activities uh, working in the forest. So the land use in Bayanga is a little bit interesting. So. In 1988, the Central African Republic government and the World Wildlife Fund committed to the establishment of a, a protected area system called the Zanga Sangha Project. And then two years later, they established uh, the Zanga Nadoki National Park, which is a part of a tri-national park system with Cameroon and uh, Congo. And they also established the Zanga Sangha Special Reserve. So while the protection of these areas, or uh, establishment of these areas has been really beneficial for protecting the region's biodiversity. The effects on the Bayaka and large and have been, uh, you know, largely left unaddressed until recently with the, the establishment of a youth group called Indima Kali. So Indima Kali is a youth group made up of Bayaka boys and girls and also Sangha Sangha boys and girls from the Bayanga area. Um, and Indima means forest in Baka, which is the language the Bayaka speak, and Kali means river in Sango, which is the local language uh, spoken by not the Bayaka. So the group was established in 2012, and since then has allowed youth from the surrounding villages to participate in a series of workshops, field activities, uh, field trips, and basically has allowed them to explore and document their heritage. So both boys and girls are being taught how to use cameras to document dances, songs, and rituals to save cultural knowledge that can be then passed down to future generations. Um, they're also being taught how to use or write financial reports. So moreover, they're um, participating in workshops on national and international legislation concerning the civil, civil and cultural rights of indigenous populations. So this has really reinforced cultural self-esteem and youth engagement within uh, the Bayaka. And so what that has actually done is kind of restored authority to the elders of the Bayaka. So it's restored traditional society, um, which from a female empowerment standpoint is very interesting because it's promoted the return to women who are comfortable speaking in egalitarian discussions and consensus seeking debates where they have as much of a say as men. Um, they also are focusing specifically on empowering women. So they brought a human rights center to Bayanga, which is focusing on a pretty nasty issue of rape of young Bayaka girls in the area. So recently they had a lawyer bring three cases to court, one which uh, involved a military personnel. So um, yes, so they're working on addressing uh, rape issues in the region. Um, they're also working on designing and conceptualizing a mobile health unit, which among its general attention to the sick and poor in the region is specifically subsidizing health care for Bayaka women and men. Um, but that's kind of addressing the issue I mentioned earlier that's associated with food insecurity issues uh, in the area and how that's impacting the Bayaka women. They're establishing clubs in schools to help um, fight discrimination of Bayaka school children. So that's allowing a platform for Bayaka kids and the Bantu kids to interact. Um, and so overall, they're really engaging with the youth 
and allowing for a transfer of cultural knowledge. Um, and they're providing you know, an avenue for the Bayaka to develop techniques that are allowing them to subsist off the forest in current society, but also providing them with what I like to think is a, of as a toolkit for um, addressing how they will continue to subsist as climate change continues and you know, land use patterns change in the future. But as with anything, there are potential improvements. So they are working, you know, like I said, very well towards gender equality. But I would like to see um, groups such as Indima Kali work more firmly to empower women specifically. So, because of the unique location of where it is, you know, in a nas national park, um, and the need for conservation to also simultaneously occur in this region, I think conservation, you know, needs to really move towards more inclusive models where various ways that local communities in the area, and specifically women, are utilizing the forest, that becomes more of a focus. So one thing that I, you know, I would propose is that Indy McCulley, in partnership with the World Wildlife Fund in the region, start um, dedicating a certain percentage of the jobs that they're using in the conservation sector to women. So right now, uh, the Bantu and Bayaka men are the ones that are um, the guides and the trackers, you know, taking tourists in and also just doing basic working with researchers like me. But the women have the knowledge and they have the capabilities to do it as well. And so I think you know, a certain percentage of these jobs were set aside for them to do. Um, that would generate self-confidence, financial stability, financial independence. That would you know, really be beneficial for empowering them. <coughs> and more than that, um, I think groups like Indima Kali are in you know, a unique position to start in educating girls in the context of the environment so that they themselves could step into these jobs later on. So, um, you know, and I think all of this needs to be paired with uh, financial management education as well. So once money is received, you know how to invest it, you know how to, you know, loan it. They have cooperative networks of women, um, I think, in places like India that are deciding as a group who to loan money to, for what purpose, for how long. And so I see, you know, a lot of potential with, uh, you know, with this avenue. So ultimately, I think that cultivating a deeper understanding of the environment within women and young girls, in combination with financially empowering them, will be, you know, very beneficial for uh, providing more opportunities for women in this region, and in mitigating the impacts of climate change. So I, you know, anticipate that multidimensional programs such as Indimacali will play great roles in the future in assuring life on land, uh, both human and non-human, continues to flourish. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. Our next speaker is going to be Adina Mystery. She is a high school senior, and she's a member of her school's Academic Honor Society, the founder and president of the Pratham Club, as well as the founding member and president of the Limitless Club at her school. Officer of the Lion's Heart Class of 2019 Blue Girls Group, a community service organization. And she's also a teacher for 11 to, sorry, a 9 to 11 year olds at the Zoroastrian religion classes in New York. Adina represents her school's speech and de debate team in exemplar speech and original oratory competitions and enjoys playing the violin at her school orchestra. Her commitment to the education and empowerment of girls, coupled with community, coupled with her belief in good thoughts, good words, and good deeds, inspires several volunteer community service efforts she is actively involved in. So please welcome Adina. Thank you. Hi everyone, I'm Adina, and today I'll be presenting Homework Over Housework, Pratham Second Chance Program. So to start off, this is a general overview of education in India. In recent decades, India has made significant strides on access to schooling and enrollment rates in primary education, but dropout rates and low levels of learning remain challenges for the government. Primary school enrollment in India has been a success story largely due to various programs and drives to increase enrollment even in remote areas. With enrollment reaching at least 96% since 2009 and girls making up more than 50% of new students, it is clear that many problems of access to schooling have been addressed. 
In addition, improvements to infrastructure have been a priority to achieve this. And India now has over 1.4 million schools with upwards of 7.7 .7 million teachers. Sadly, despite these improvements, keeping children in school through graduation is still an issue and dropout rates continue to be high. Nationally, over 29% of children drop out before completing five years of primary school. This lands India among the top five nations for out of school children of primary school age with over 1.4 million six to 11 year olds not attending school. Additionally, the quality of learning is a major issue and reports show that children are not achieving class appropriate learning levels. Of the 26 million children, of the 26 million Indian children who enter first grade each year, half will reach fifth grade unable to read or write. Furthermore, close to 78% of children in third grade and about 50% of children in fifth grade will be unable to read a second grade level text. Without immediate and urgent help, children cannot effectively progress in the education system. And so improving the quality of learning in schools is the next big challenge for both the state and central government. And I've seen these effects firsthand. In the summer of 2015, I visited India and spent time volunteering to teach India in, to teach math, English and math in a Balwadi, or preschool in one of the lower income areas of Mumbai. Pictured here is Kavya with her teacher. She began coming to the Balwadi two years ago. The teachers told me that when she first came, she was extremely malnourished and would sleep through most of the school day due to her home conditions. Her father had died when she was younger and her mother was struggling to provide for her and her five other siblings. Now, after help and support from the Balwadi teachers, Kavya is one of their best students mm -hmm. and is more than willing to help students get caught up with other material. I returned to New York determined to help and make a difference. I founded a club at my high school during my sophomore year dedicated to raising awareness and opportun about opportunities to educate girls in India. Last year, we invested in multiple events that raised funds to impact the lives of two young women in India by enabling them to finish their high school education. The organization that we donated to was called Pratham. Pratham was established in 1995 to provide education to children in Mumbai slums. It is one of the largest and most successful non-governmental educational NGOs. More, their mission of every child in school and learning well drives to address learning. Through their rigorously tested and scalable solutions, they transform the classroom resulting in academic achievements and self-confidence of their students. And rather than building schools, they develop low-cost solutions to address gaps in the education system and work in collaboration with India's governments, educators, and industry to improve learning outcomes and influence education policy. They make learning a community effort by engaging parents, teachers, and volunteers at a grassroots level. One of Pratham's programs is the Second Chance Program, which was founded in 2011. The program enables girls to return to school and complete their secondary education, unlocking a world of possibilities previously closed off to them. In addition to a four month long foundation course and extensive subject specific tutoring, the year long program offers sessions in life skills, nutrition, childcare, and computer literacy. Studies show that educated females lead healthier more productive lives benefiting the community at large and contributing to a stronger society. And since the introduction of the program in 2011, more than 27,000 girls and young women have been given the opportunity to finish their high school education. A typical student in the Second Chance program has not been in school for a few years. The 80% of young women who drop out before graduating do so for a variety of reasons mostly because their family can no longer afford to have their daughter not working, or because the teaching methods are ineffective and many students end up failing out. Pratham's program gives them a second chance to finish their education. I'd like to share the story of Ananji, Ahila, and Raja. They just completed the life skills portion of their second chance program curriculum and spoke with their sarpanch, or village head, about ideas to benefit their community. In the remote village of Navagaran, they were given an assignment as part of their life skills module. 
identify an issue in your community, and work towards resolving it. These three young women took this opportunity to demonstrate how classroom lessons can be applied to achieve real-world results. The Life Skills module focuses on abilities like problem solving, critical and creative thinking, communication, and interpersonal skills. It was introduced to give girls and young women the skills and self-confidence necessary to succeed in their lives outside of the classroom. A highlight explained that in her village, the woman had to walk a long distance to fetch water. So they spoke to the village head and got a bore well installed. Now, I know that this may seem small, but to these young women, it was proof that they could step outside of their designated roles within their society. And now these women no longer have to walk miles to fetch water and instead, and instead can spend time on their education and strengthening their community. But Pratham doesn't only stop at an education. They're also invested in how their students use their and how their students use their education by helping them find and secure jobs through the vocational program. And there is so much more that can be done. On an individual level, one can donate, join a chapter or volunteer for an organization, or even start their own campaign. So many other organizations have also arise that focus on other aspects of human rights that will enable and encourage women to get an education. For example, Commit to Change seeks to provide education for orphan girls and other at-risk young women in India. Safety emerged to equip women with the tools to help, them keep them, to help keep them safe from acts of sexual violence. Women on Wing focuses on creating sustainable methods of income for women. And so far, they have created 182,000 jobs for women in rural India, resulting in better conditions for their families and communities. This women's education is not only an issue in India, but it's an issue around the world. And we have the resources to help. Thank you. Thank you, Adina. Our next speaker is um, Nadia John. She recently received her bachelor's in social sciences with an honor specialization in political science in French immersion from the University of Ottawa in Canada. International affairs has always been a part of Nadia's personal and academic interest. Her passion for learning languages and community building has benefited her in the national and global engagement opportunities she has seized. From working with political parties and campaigns and attending model UN conferences, working for marginalized women and survivors for an NGO in Nepal. Um, Nadia's myriad of experiences has helped her think without borders and further recognize that addressing gender disparities requires meaningful dialogue and collaboration. Please welcome Nadia. Hello, I am Nadia, as I said. So in relation to the theme, I too was informed of the power of educating women and girls. An internship I completed in the spring of 2018 in Kathmandu allowed me to see how NGOs work on the grounds to ensure women and girls have equal opportunity. I immersed myself for three months in a developing country working with Ban Landmines Campaign Nepal. I'll be using the acronym NCBL. Um, and it was nothing short of eye-opening. My responsibility in essence was to write articles and create posters for their online awareness campaign as a way to increase visibility from potential collaborators and donors. One article I wrote um, actually captured the attention of an organization and influenced them to subsidize the education of two girls in rural Nepal. I'll share one of their touching stories later in the presentation. So understanding NCBL's foundation will clarify why the education of girls became part of their mission. The civil war from 1996 to 2006 was fought between the communist Maoists and the government, and both parties used improvised explosive devices and landmines as political weapons. More than 13,000 were killed in the decade-long insurgency, and since 2006, the end of the conflict, BBC has reported 473 casualties, of which 78 of them were fatal. And this is despite Nepal declaring themselves landmine free in June 2011. 
Its government still hasn't signed the Convention on Cluster Munitions, nor the Mine Ban Treaty, the Ottawa Treaty. Its rural regions still have explosive remnants of war, and the government does little to support its victims, particularly the women and children. NCBL was established in 1995 with the objective of raising awareness among civil society about the loss of lives and property caused by landmines, and to also pressurize the government to sign the, man ban, the Mine Ban Treaty and the Convention on Cluster Munitions. Um, but their advocacy in mitigating the risks of explosive remnants of war goes way beyond politics. They address the human, humanitarian impact through victim assistance. The Girl Child Education Program and Youth Ambassador Program are two really commendable initi initiatives that promote girls' education. So the Girl Child Education Scholarship Program. This program supports girls who have either lost a parent due to conflict or have been physically impacted by a bomb explosion or cannot afford to pay school fees. In a YouTube commentary, documentary that I highly recommend called Towards the Light, tells several stories of families who struggled to survive after the, their father was killed by the army, police, or Maoists during the conflict. Conflict victims feel extremely helpless, as you, you, you'll see in the documentary, and the mothers are unable to financially support their children because of the patriarchy and the highly dependent nature of the man of the house. By giving girls the means to contribute to continue their studies, they can strive to be more than just a housewife. The girls are especially motivated when they see the harm of being entirely dependent on a man. Also, attending school means that they do not need to enter child marriage and are inspired to reach their full professional and personal potential. Now I'm gonna share with you Rashila's story. It's really worth sharing since she's a prime example of a girl who is getting control over her life through education. She experienced the consequence of superstition and discrimination at a very young age. Her mother desperately wanted a son and fell prey to superstition. The villagers told her that she should crawl under an elephant if she wanted a boy. It so happened, I know it's crazy, um, it so happened that an elephant carrying a priest was walking through the village and so Rashila crawled under the elephant beneath it, and she got squashed by its foot and died while pregnant. And this, this happened in 2001. It is really complicated to question the traditions of superstition and the religious cultural favoring of males. But now Rashila, through her personal experience, doesn't blame the animal, but holds the society at large for her mother's death. The new generation of Nepal should be self-sufficient and generate new definitions of gender not prioritizing males, for example. Um, and this is Rashila. She's the one looking at the camera. And this is, it's kind of blurry because I took a screenshot from the documentary itself towards the light. Highly recommend, write that down. So women, in essence, should have the power to decide from right or wrong and take control over their destiny, unlike Rashila's mother had the opportunity to. Second, we have the Youth Ambassador Program. Now the purpose of the YA program is to reach out to girls through mine risk education. That is one of the pillars of NCBL, mine risk education, preventing further victims. And to invigorate them to pass on their knowledge and personal stories to fellow youth. Essentially, they mobilize girls who are survivors of explosive remnants of war post-conflict from marginalized communities poor backgrounds in remote regions, which is actually 80% of Nepal. 80% of Nepal is in the rural, really dense, really low density of population, so inaccessible to roads, services, etc. cetera. Um, but it also mobilizes women and girls from the Dalit caste, which is the untouchable caste in India. Um, indigenous and girls living with one or more disability. During my internship, the YA program accepted two new applicants Anita, who lost a hand when she was seven and is now able to graduate high school, and Tusi, who lost a leg at eight. Both girls were given mine risk education training and resources, along with the opportunity to grasp onto their strength and the boundless value they can add to society. Now time for Tusi's story. So the last story I, want to, story I want to share with you is that of Tusi Darji. She's a 21-year-old girl residing in Gorisinj, 
Kapilvatsu, in southern Nepal. She and her family illegally lived on a piece of land that belonged to the forestry department, which was also 50 meters away from a wire fence of an army barrack, where landmines were placed during the Civil War. The children in her community used to play in the area between the fence and her house. Even though there were danger notice signs put up, people generally didn't know the significance of the warning. Tusi knew deep down that she wasn't supposed to cross the fence, but in the end was unaware of the great potential risk. So when Tusi's goats one day on May 2008 passed the fence into the barrack, she crossed the restricted area to retrieve her animals without, hesi without hesitation. But little did she know that she would step on a landmine and as a result become a severe amputee. On that day, Tusi, at only the age of eight, lost one leg. Tusi's accident led, her, led to her family using all of, their, all of their savings for her recovery. In an interview with Al Jazeera, uh, you can find on Huffington Post if you look up NCBL, Tusi, if you look up Tusi's story, Huffington Post. Um, in the interview with Al Jazeera, Tusi quote unquote said, Sometimes my brother and mother say, because of you, we are in this condition. Otherwise, we would, have built a, we would have built a house. When they say that, I wish I had just died. And this was just said at 10 years old. She eventually received the prosthetic with the help of a bursary granted by NCBL's Girl Child Education Scholarship Program. NCBL has been supporting her socio-physiologically because it is understood that she is part of the delete caste which means that she is both at a social and a physical disadvantage in her community. NCBL is proud to call Tusi a valuable member of the Survivor Network. Her confidence has blossomed, and she has been engaged with fellow landmine victims through her organization of educational events in local schools. However, NCBL's resources were limited and prevented the expansion of the YA program. This is where my article showed interest in receiving financial res support by sharing the, both stories on their website. And in the end, Eden Social Welfare Foundation in Taiwan stepped in to further fund her education and to enable NCBL to conduct field visits, distribute landmine awareness material, and give a voice to the ambassadors who can teach mine risk education in schools and communities at large. Because Tulsi was given a prosthetic, she felt more positive attending school and she didn't have to pay for health costs at the expense of her education. Plus, giving her the chance to be a part of the YA program means that she has become a leader by teaching others the risks, signs, and history of explosives. By making sure girls like Tulsi pursue an education, they have the physical and mental capacity to pass on their knowledge, all while transforming them into empowered agents of change. But that transformation is infinite and can only occur if people recognize the immense passion and influence that our mothers, sisters, daughters, aunts, and wives can offer to every aspect of humanity. Thank you. Thank you, Nadia. I just want to conclude with this um, saying from Jawaharlal Nehru. He said, to awaken people, it is the woman that must be awakened. Once she's on the move, the family moves, the village moves, the nation moves. He is so right because as we see from the examples today and summarizing what we just heard, it is educating the girl child, even though it comes with challenges and cultural differences, we have to overcome this because educating the girl child is so beneficial not only to the girl, but to her family and to the surrounding community. Once you have an education, you have knowledge, and knowledge is power. And when you have power, you can change the world for the better. Thank you. Are there any questions for the panel? Yes. Thank you very much for a beautiful uh, and touching uh, presentation. Uh, all the stories and the presentations were remarkable and enlightening. Uh, and, but my question was, how does this uh, fit into the uh, 
Federation of Zoroastrians and it, are you all Zoroastrians and, uh, and uh, in the communities or principally in Nepal and although there was the you know, Central Africa as well so it's not concentrated in uh, India with uh, region. Yeah. Uh, so <coughs> Okay, so to answer your question, um, yes, we are all Zoroastrians here on the panel, and uh, we're all members of the Federation of Zoroastrian Associations of North America, which is the NGO that is affiliated with the UN. Um, and as part of our NGO, we also have programs that we offer our youth. For example, we have a Youth Without Borders program, Zoroastrian Youth Without Borders, and uh, what we do is encourage and enable the youth to go out to other countries and work with other NGOs, depending on um, the area of expertise that they have or the area of study. Um, and so a, a lot of the people here have had opportunities through their universities. Um, and if they need additional funds, then they, we usually help fundraise and get them funds for them to go to the um, other countries to experience um, what it's like to work for NGOs in these different countries. Any other questions? Yes. A question. This is for the third speaker. You put up a graph that showed the reasons why um, girls dropped out, um, and 25% on the graph showed it was because they failed in school, I'm assuming. Is there any data on those external forces being a part of why they fail? So to repeat the question, it was um, the 25% of <coughs> girls who drop out of school because they failed out of school, like what um, influence do external factors play? I'm not exactly sure on the numbers, but I do believe that there are certain factors of that. They have to stay at home on certain days, so it's harder for them to get to school. And also what um, Afri was saying earlier with Ashton Okai and how their parents would rather have their sons go to school. And then there are also limited resources within each family. So I imagine that that's why some of the schools, why some of the girls do end up dropping out. And then in addition, ex in extremely rural areas, the um, the quality of learning and the teaching material and sometimes the teachers as well it's harder for them to relate to the kids and then for also the girls to kind of pay attention and put in all of their efforts so that might be another possible reason why they might end up failing out of school thank you yeah. any other questions yes i just want to add to that comment it's also um, females, uh, especially in such situations, also because we menstruate. So over here, where, where we have our privilege, we can go out and buy menstrual products. But in countries and in villages, they don't have those. So females actually have to stay at home for a week, and a week every single month adds up. So that's another reason that people wouldn't stay at home, and it's something that should also be addressed. Okay. Yeah, all right, okay. Thank you everyone for coming.